Amendment Governor John C. Carney Jr. to the joint session. Please escort the governor in. Governor, the house is yours. Well, this is a little different. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Hall Long, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President Pro Tem, members of the 151st General Assembly, members of my cabinet, wherever you are, distinguished members of the judiciary, and my fellow Delawareans. Thank you for inviting me into the chamber today. I wish we could have more people than are here with us. I'm delighted to have my wife, Tracy. Thank you for inviting her in. <laughs> Normally, the cabinet sits over here uh, with Tracy, and they're not here today. So she might have the biggest job of all which is to lead the applause lines. <laughs> so if you want to help her, feel free to do so. On January 23rd, 2020, I stood in this same spot to deliver the State of the State Address. The chamber was packed. The word coronavirus meant nothing to most of us. We were looking forward to a bright year ahead. Our plans did not include a global pandemic, I can tell you that. So while we canceled our plans and turned our attention to beating this pandemic, so did the people of our state. These last two years have brought unprecedented challenges for every Delaware family. Many have lost loved ones. Others lost their business. Our children missed important time in classrooms. We missed sports games, graduations, weddings, and funerals. Every one of us has experienced some type of loss during this pandemic. If nothing else, we all have that in common. And as we've learned the hard way over the past few weeks, we aren't through it yet. More than 300 members of the Delaware National Guard are at work right now helping take pressure off of our hospitals and getting Delawareans tested and vaccinated. And I wanna take this moment, I want you to help me to thank General Barry, our guardsmen and women, and all the healthcare workers for their incredible efforts. Please help me in thanking those members. General Barry has been an incredible leader during the last two years of those, with those men and women. And I can tell you how enthusiastic, how delighted the hospital workers were to see our men and women in uniform show up over the past couple of weeks. I also want to thank Dr. Carol Rattay and her entire public health team for their hard work and, and, and importantly for their resilience. And I want to recognize DEMA Director A.J. Saul. He's amazing. And his team and all our emergency personnel across our state for their great work. They have been incredible. <laughs> Over the last year, Director Shaw, Dr. Rattay, and their teams helped deliver more than 1.6 million vaccines to Delawareans. Our Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long was instrumental in those efforts. She rallied communities, worked vaccine sites, went out into neighborhoods, making sure people in every corner of our state, particularly many who are forgotten, had access to those vaccines. And community leaders stepped up big across the state, people like Reverend Rita Page, Bernice Edwards, Darrell Chambers and his team, and Maria Matos. <laughs> D 
Because of the efforts of so many, we were one of only 20 states to meet President Biden's goal, 70% of adults vaccinated by the 4th of July. This work simply saved lives. We provided... <laughs> You're getting good help there, uh, Tracy. We provided more than $400 million in support to small businesses. We supported child care providers who stayed on the job throughout this crisis. And thanks to the hard work of educators, we got our children back in classrooms. That's why one of the most important priorities, that's why despite the trying times and because of the ongoing sacrifice of so many Delawareans, I'm optimistic today. Over the past two years, we've seen clearly that the people of our state are resilient. They're innovative. They're kind. They never give up. They're focused on the present, but hopeful for the future. Because of the incredible strength of the people of our state and because of their resilience, I can tell you confidently today that the state of our state is strong and we are eager for what lies ahead. As we recover from this pandemic, it's clear that expanding economic opportunity for all Delaware families must be job number one. We can all agree on this. A good job solves a lot of problems. So let's start there. On my first day in office in 2017, we partnered with the private sector to strengthen our economic development efforts. Working with all of you, we created the Delaware Prosperity Partnership. And that idea has paid off. Despite the pandemic, Delaware employers have added nearly 20,000 new jobs. The DPP helped them retain thousands more. Delaware's economy has rebounded from the worst effects of COVID-19 more quickly than we could have imagined. Our unemployment rate is now just above 5%, down from a high of 13.4% in 2020. Just last month, financial technology startup Investor Cash Management, or ICM, announced that it would move its headquarters from Chicago to downtown Wilmington. <laughs> ICM plans to invest $15 million in its new headquarters and create almost 400 new jobs. Prelude Therapeutics, an innovative company focused on new and effective cancer treatments, has just signed a 13-year lease for new headquarters at DuPont's Old Chestnut Run campus. The company grew out of the Delaware innovation space, our partnership with UD and DuPont at the Experimental Station to support startup tech companies. Insight is another growing company with roots in the Delaware innovation space. Their new building in Wilmington, which is almost complete, will accommodate 500 employees. We're building Delaware's economy of the future. And I especially want to thank members of the General Assembly who sit on the board of the DPP. Senators Walsh and Penny John, Representatives Bush and Yurik. Please help me support your members. We appreciate very much their participation and feedback. And as they can tell you, these new jobs are not just confined to the northern part of our state. We work hard to, to promote central and, and lower Delaware. Baltimore-based textile manufacturer Avalon Industries is relocating and expanding in Dover. Miller Metals, a longtime leader in Delaware manufacturing, is adding jobs in Bridgeville. And Wuxi STA Pharmaceuticals is preparing to add 500 and maybe more and a half billion dollars of investment at a new manufacturing facility in Middletown. We also have some fun news on the tourism front. In March, the Atlantic 10 Conference will bring its Women's Basketball Championship to the Chase Fieldhouse in Wilmington. You gotta go see those women turn it on. And in August, the Wilmington Country Club will host the PGA and thousands of fans for the BMW Championship. Applause 
Delaware is on the map. These events are putting us on the map and the future is bright. And in terms of national and international attention, it certainly doesn't help to be the home of the President of the United States. It really doesn't. He fills up a lot of hotel rooms when he revisits our state. Support from the federal government and our President Joe Biden will help us build on this economic work in communities up and down our state. Using federal stimulus dollars, we will build and upgrade libraries in every county. We'll help nonprofits modernize their buildings so that they can better serve the people of our state. We'll significantly increase resources for our gun violence prevention program in Wilmington and Dover. Working with many of you and House Majority Leader Longhurst in particular, we'll use federal money to improve our state's mental health services with the help of our lieutenant governor as well. We'll supercharge our state's largest infrastructure plan. We'll repair roads and bridges, invest even more in public transit, and build out electric vehicle infrastructure, so important for our future. That will make community, communities commute shorter, improve safety on our roads, and prepare Delaware for the future. We're also investing in our environment, and we have a new climate action plan to address the effects of climate change. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we know that vibrant outdoor spaces help attract new workers and families to our state. I especially want to thank Senator Hansen for her work to protect our natural environment. Senator Hansen. Delaware State Parks continue to be among the best in the country. And you don't have to take my word for it. In November, our parks again received the National Gold Medal for Excellence. And Delaware was o is only one of two states to win this award. Everyone should get out and enjoy our parks. And just off the press, press uh, machines, surf license, Sure, fishing license go on sale on February the 1st. And they'll stop it. They'll stop it. <laughs> when I release my budget next week, we'll set aside another $30 million for open space and farmland preservation. Delaware has one of the most robust programs in the country. And through a, a, th a years-long partnership with more majority leaders Longhurst and Townsend and your good work, we created the Clean Water Trust Fund. With federal support, we'll be investing more than $400 million in Delaware's clean water infrastructure. That is a really big deal. It will be focused on underserved communities, many if not most of which are in Kent and Sussex County. That's an unprecedented opportunity to fix long-standing problems. We all need to do our part to keep our natural areas clean and free of trash. Just a look around. It's a mess out there. That's why we're continuing our efforts to keep DE litter free. That's our slogan. And I'm ter determined, almost single-handedly, to help clean up our highways and byways. Help us out in your districts. We appreciate that. All these investments will strengthen our economy for the future. We know that nationally and here in Delaware, small businesses jo drive job creation. That's why, for the first time ever, we put a hyper-focus on small business inside state government, the Division of Small Business. That includes supporting innovative new tech companies and mom and pop mainstream businesses. Since 2019, our EDGE Grants program has supported more than 35 small businesses. These businesses are creating jobs and poised for growth. At the same time, we invested more than $400 million in pandemic relief money to shore up businesses hardest hit by the pandemic, like bars and restaurants museum, childcare centers, and hotels. Business owners that I see every day tell me this helped them keep their doors open. Supporting businesses also means supporting the employees who work there. We know workers are not just looking for a job today. They're looking for a way of life. 
especially as they start a young family. They believe that good jobs should also support their families when they need that support the most, and I agree. Senator McBride has introduced legislation that would build on the work we've done for state employees and extend paid leave into the private sector. It's the right thing to do, and it will make Delaware more attractive for younger workers with, for whom we are competing every day. And I'd like to thank Senator McBride and Representative Heffernan for their leadership on this very important issue. With the leadership of Senator Walsh, way up in the back corner, we also set Delaware on course to a $15 minimum wage. And by the way, many companies are moving to that already just to compete for employees in, this, in the labor market that we currently have. But we're taking the lead in state government. Two years ago, we made a commitment to make sure every state employee makes at least $15 an hour. Next week, when I release my budget, we'll talk more about how we're supporting state employees on the lower end of the wage scale. Going forward, building a workforce ready for jobs of the future may be our biggest single challenge here in Delaware and across the country. Delaware employers have more than 33,000 open positions right now, but only 26,000 Delawareans who are actively looking for work. Across the country, there are 10.5 million open positions, but only 6.8 million applicants. That's why we're investing more than $50 million in federal stimulus funds to strengthen our workforce training programs. We're also expanding pathways programs in our schools. These public-private investments will expand the pathways program to reach more than 6,000 middle school students and 80% of our high school students. That will help students like Im Imani Wolf Cochran, who I met recently. Imani's a senior at St. George's Tech. She spends a third of her day in an early childhood center learning on the job. Imani's focus on work-based learning will prepare her to enter the workforce as soon as she graduates from high school. And we need those childcare workers today. Ultimately, I believe, and I know you do too, that expanding economic opportunity for everyone must start in our classrooms. Over the past five years, working with all of you, we have made significant new investments in public education. From Wilmington to Dover to Georgetown, we're investing more than $300 million over the next two years for new school construction. And I want to thank the members of the Bomb Bill Committee and your chairs Senator Poor, there she is, way up in the corner. And Representative Heffernan again for your support and leadership. Thank you, Senator Poor. We know the pandemic put a strain on every part of our education system, and I know you know it too and hear from, from your districts, from school bus drivers to classroom teachers to school nurses. Please join me in thanking our educators and everyone who works in our schools for their incredible efforts. Thank you. And they are working so hard amidst this winter surge that we're seeing across our state, I can tell you. Amidst all these challenges, Last year, the General Assembly made permanent new resources to support low-income students and English learners in our schools. Thanks to Representative Williams and Senator Poor, we finally invested in K-3 basic special education. And those resources are making a real difference in classrooms. One thing that the past two years have taught me is that there is a valuing in acknowledging and celebrating the complexity of our state. 
and our complex and often difficult history. That's why I was proud to sign Representative Dorsey Walker's bill, ensuring that a robust, accurate black history curriculum is taught in Delaware public schools. I was also fortunate to join black clergy and community leaders in visiting the newly discovered African burial ground at the John Dickinson Plantation and to partner with the Department of State, the Office of Statewide Equity Initiatives, the Delaware Heritage Commission, and Delaware State University to tell the public the real history of that site. It is really special. Over the past few months, I've been focused on making sure we finally deliver for the children of the city of Wilmington. Despite the best efforts of teachers and administrators, children in our largest city are not getting the education they need to be successful in life. We can do better. We can, and we must. These children and their families deserve our best efforts. Over the last month, I've knocked doors and talked directly to parents and students in neighborhoods across the city. I know they're eager for change. They want better. I've talked to and heard from educators, teachers in all of our city schools, spent half a day in Bancroft and half a day in Warner. The idea of a Wilmington Collaborative is based on models we've seen successful in other parts of the country. And so we're asking districts that serve our students in the city, Red Clay, Brandywine, and Christina, to work together on behalf of these children and their families. This model will place more decision-making in the hands of educators and local communities. And it'll offer more support for students, families, and importantly, for the teachers that are in those classrooms every day. It will place a hyper-focus on these students and the challenges they face. Doesn't solve every problem, to be sure. And we will continue to work with Senator Lockman and the Reading Commission to focus on issues around redistricting and the high school challenge for city students. These are certainly very important issues. But we can't let those difficult issues hold us up. We can't afford to wait, and we can't afford to keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I hope you'll join me in finally doing right by these children. We know that a good education is not the only thing that families need in order to be successful. State Housing Director Eugene Young and his team have been working hard to address a housing crisis that has been made work worse by the pandemic, and you know what I'm talking about. Using federal funds, the State Housing Authority is partnering with the private sector to rebuild the Riverside community in Northeast Wilmington. It's a very exciting project. The Housing Authority has made available $50 million in rental and mortgage assistance to struggling Delawareans across our state. And over the next three years, we will invest federal dollars to revitalize and develop more than 1,200 affordable housing units in Kent and Sussex counties. That's in addition to expanding down payment and settlement assistance for home buyers. These investments will go a long way to support Delawareans who need it most and strengthen our economy at the same time. It's also way past due to make sure that every home and business is connected to the internet. Currently, close to 11,600 Delaware homes and businesses lack access to high-speed broadband. Delawareans rely on stable internet connections to apply for jobs, help their children do homework, work from home, or continue their, their education online. We're investing over $100 million in federal money to make sure everyone has access to a hardwired connection. Hardwired connection. And these connections are mostly in Kent and Sussex counties. We also continue to tackle the epidemic of substance abuse statewide. Our Lieutenant Governor's leadership on the Behavioral Health Consortium is having a real impact. Despite the national rise in overdose rates during COVID, Delaware was one of only four states to see a decrease in the rate of overdose deaths. The Lieutenant Governor will continue to be a driving force to ensure access to treatment and prevention. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my wife, Tracy, for her support during this challenging time. 
She's holding up the whole cabinet in absentia there on this side. And for her relentless advocacy on behalf of children across our state, I can tell you how much she cares. She always reminds me how much children have sacrificed through this pandemic to keep their families and communities safe. Through her First Chance initiative, Tracy has put a spotlight on the issues facing children and has shown the value of getting people together to work together. Through Trauma Matters Delaware and in partnership with Casey Family Programs, Tracy is tackling the effects of trauma on Del Delaware children and families, nothing more important today. Tracy has also partnered with the, the Food Bank of Delaware, which has stepped up time and again during this pandemic. I'd like to thank, thank you for, for showing your appreciation for the food bank across our state. Probably our most popular statewide initiative this year has been Tracy's work with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Everybody loves Dolly. This program, seriously, this program, and, and, and what a great program. It provides free books to children enrolling newborns before they leave the hospital and helps families build libraries that can last for generations. Please join me once again in thanking Tracy for her work. Thank you for that. Let me be clear about this point, and you won't be surprised to hear it from me. We can't do all these things. We can't make investments in public, ed public education or infrastructure or public safety without a long-term sustainable financial plan. Responsibly managing our state budget is more important than ever. And that's what every taxpayer I've ever talked to over 20 years in public service expects. Over the past five years, we've worked hard and worked together to get our state budget in order. And I'd like to thank members of the JFC and your chair, Senator Pardee and Representative Carson, for your work. Thank you, all of you, for that work. And it, it takes all of us. We know that. But the JF, JFC does so much of that important work. We have built significant new reserves, higher than any time I can remember, and directed one-time revenue into one-time infrastructure projects. We made it through the worst of the pandemic, better than most states, without painful budget cuts, without tax increases, without layoffs of state employees. Next week, I'll, I'll present, please. And so next week, I will present a budget that stays true to these principles. We will again invest in our classrooms with expansion of opportunity funding. We will use one-time revenue to continue the largest infrastructure program in Delaware history. We have a unique opportunity to make real progress on these issues, not just because of our work here in Delaware, but also because of the passage of the President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure bill. With these investments, will strengthen our economy, expand opportunity, and support families as we finally emerge from this pandemic. And we'll do it responsibly, and we'll do it together. As most of you know, I've served in government now in some capacity for nearly three decades. I've never seen a more challenging time. As I think about the past two years and how it fits into the long history of our great state, I can't help but think about the recent passing of Governor Ruth Ann Minner. Governor Minner did not have an easy time leading up to being governor or during her two terms wrestling with your predecessors over a laundry list of sticky issues. But one thing you could count on with Ruth Ann was when she was faced with a political issue or a policy choice, she always approached it through the lens of how it will affect people's everyday lives, ordinary folk. And another thing you could count on was that when she made a tough call and she had to make many, she would stand by it. Please join me in a round of applause to pay tribute to this remarkable leader, the first woman governor of our state.
Thank you very much for that. Throughout this pandemic, I've had to make a lot of tough calls. And I know we've not always agreed on every decision, and I respect those differences. But I hope you know this. I've always put Delawareans first. Since the early days of March 2020, when I wake up each morning and when I go to bed, go to sleep, I guess go to bed, I don't sleep right away, <laughs> each night, I'm thinking about the health of our people and about the businesses that employ them. I know this has been a difficult time, but Delawareans have proven their resilience. Every time they've been knocked down, they get right back up. As a result, unemployment is down. Children are back in schools. Small businesses survived. And we're supercharging our economy with federal resources. So my message today is simply this. We will come through this crisis. And when we do, we'll be ready as a state to move forward together. It's my sincere hope that when I stand across the building next year before you, the pandemic will be firmly in the rearview mirror. But the last two years have taught me that whatever happens, our state, our beloved state of Delaware, will rise to the occasion. Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless our great state.